Hello again, welcome back. Uh, now in the last, uh, in the outro part of the previous Galtor video, I mentioned that there would be these battle force values and uh, with write-ups of all of the uh, units that were involved in the Galtor campaign. So what you're going to be seeing on screen now is the legend, and this is going to be important for anyone who's going to be interested in the actual sort of, um, the makeup of all these different units. So you can see there's a legend, you have units uh, that are listed from L to A, L1 to 4 are light mechs, M1 to 6 are mediums, H1 to 5 are heavies, and A1, A1 to A3 are assault mechs. That's pretty straightforward. V will equal vehicle, however, the number afterwards denotes what type. So a V1 is a truck, a V2 is an armoured truck, a V3 is a heavy tracked vehicle, a V4 is also a heavy tracked vehicle, V5 is a medium tracked vehicle, V6 is hover, V7 is light tracked, and V8 is a wheeled scout vehicle. Then we have I, going through 1 to 4. I is infantry, so 1 is regular, 2 is heavy, 3 is motorised, and 4 is jump infantry. Then we have air units, which are stars. So star of a H, heavy air unit. Star of an M, medium. Star of an L, light. Artillery are listed at AR, with 1 and 2 being light uh, and 2 being heavy. And then we have the fighting status. GR for green, RG for regular, VT for veteran, and EL for elite. And there are other abbreviations, which is why I said previously, you may want to have a, uh, a, a separate image of this. Uh, I will try and find a way to see if I can link the image, or you may just want to have the video up twice paused on this part to be able to quickly check. But other abbreviations include B30 and B15. Uh, these are units, usually an air unit, that are equipped with bombs of uh, the noted strength. So bomb 30, bomb 15. Uh, ECM, unit equipped with electronic countermeasure. Not ECM like a mech, a different type, like um, r um, basically uh, countering uh, radio signals, that kind of thing for communications. ESR, unit has equipment to enhance its ESR detection range. Um, extra mech, unit possesses an additional mech. Uh, jump, a normally non-jump unit, is fitted with jump jets. Plus 2 FP, a lance with, that has upgraded its firepower by 2. Plus 2 arm, a lance that has upgraded its armor by 2. And AEP, this unit, usually recon unit, has active electronic probes. Again, not beagle probes, usually be like scout probes, that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, uh, with that out of the way, uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's go to the first of the Federated Sons units, shall we? First up is the Dahar Draconis March Militia. This was commanded by General Sir William Dobson, whose primary mission was sector defense. Their strength was 108% listed, with a standard fighting rating of around regular. Their losses accounted for 95.333%. They have a battle force value of 538 points. They were raised on the desert planet Dahar 4. The tough, seasoned soldiers of the Dahar Draconis March Militia looked forward to defending the Galtor front. Ironically, many mech warriors considered the tour easy after the constant skirmishing with Curitan forces on the worlds of Eladir 4, Cassius, and Barlow's Folly. Although most of the Dahar DMM mechs and mech warriors perished during the Siege of New Derry, many techs and aerospace fighter pilots survived. Presently, there are a cadre for a new regiment recruiting on Dahar 4. The new regiment consists of the same type of people that comprised the old regiment, the weathered miners and prospectors who work the dusty silicon and bauxite mines on Dahar 4. There, the miners learn to work with sophisticated dredging, refining and drilling machines that rival battle mechs in their complexity and power. Twenty years ago, during this single Curita raid on the planet, a company of miners defended their stake using the 40-foot-tall Brooks Incorporated three-man digging machines. The giant machines were fast enough to rush the Curitan mechs and agile enough to dodge most of the laser and missile fire. Operating such machines makes it easy for the miners to learn the mysteries of the battle mech. After a few seasons of using the digging machines under the hot suns of Daha, many men look for an easier life in the military training camps that dot the world. So as you can see there, there's the battle force value on the right, so you can see uh, by cross-referencing the legend, you can see just the, the exact setup for the Dahar Draconis March Militia. I'll do this for all of them going forward, so you can see all of the different squadrons or battalions that were listed, and then given a complete strength there at the bottom that gives you their battle force value. So that'll be the process for all of these, so we'll move on to the next one. The Raman Draconis March Militia. The commander was Major General Baden Powell. Their mission, sector defense. Strength, 99% listed. Standard fight rating, green. Losses, 92.989%. 
battle force value of 425 points. Along the Draconis frontier, many worlds cannot raise a full regiment for defence. Therefore, a light regiment, like the Roman DMM, spreads out among them, each battalion assigned to a different world and tenuously linked by hyperpulse stations and a few jump ships. The purpose of such battalions is to protect the light industries and agriculture on the frontier from the occasional pirate or rogue mercenary. They weren't meant to fight pitched battles, which proved disastrous for the Roman DMM on Galtor III. The Roman DMM rarely trained together as a full regiment. The battalion's weak discipline was often cited in official inspection tours. Filled with green mech warriors barely able to control their machines, the companies never fielded more than a lance at one time. The rest would lay mothballed in repair facilities. To conserve supply, General Baden-Powell even forbid the firing of live ammunition during manoeuvres. Considering its handicaps of men and materiel, the unit still performed remarkably well. They unwaveringly faced a con concentrated attack by three regiments and caused heavy losses in return. In particular, its battalion and company officers fought extremely well. None of the officers would survive the destruction of the regiment. The Roman Air Company had an interesting time on Galtor III. Many pilots would fly captured Sholagar light fighters, identical to the Curitan fighters. With electronic countermeasures and strict radio silence, Roman DMM pilots could approach quite close to Curita units without challenge. Although measured in fractions of a second, the advantage was enough to rack up an impressive kill score for the command. The Bremen's Draconis March Militia Commander Lieutenant General Mary Tolman Primary Mission Quick Response Force Strength 105% listed Standard Fighting Rating Regular Losses 31.666% Battle force value 630 points. One of the best generals in the Federated Sons, Lieutenant General Tolman is a ferocious, technically brilliant, and completely uncompromising fighter. She pushes her mech warriors to heights no other militia unit or many house regiments could possibly reach. The unit gets this strength from Tolman's infectious self confidence. The daughter of a house tech employed by the 22nd Avalon Hussars, Tolman grew up around battle mechs of every shape and size. In her late teens, she built up her own Locust battle mech from spare parts found in a junk heap. Her father forbid her to arm the mech, but Tolman soon became adept at all forms of manoeuvre. She completed the obstacle course on the 22nd Hussar's main training camp in record time, her record still standing to this day. Tolman enrolled in the NAIS, but found the dreary load of required courses too confining. She was only happy when inside a mech, poking around the innards, revamping the architecture, and redesigning the electronics. The instructors at NAIS wouldn't let her near a mech for the first two years of her study. As the repression was too much for her, she left and enlisted with the 22nd Avalon Hussars. Thirteen years later, Tolman was promoted to company commander in the Hussars, and during this time, the 22nd fought three major battles against House Lau and one against Curita. Tolman continually placing herself and her company in the thick of the fighting. Nevertheless, as daughter of a tech, her chances for promotion were non-existent she had to leave the regiment that she loved. Militia units are always searching for competent officers, and after three years as battalion commander with the Robinson DMM, she was offered her own command with a troubled regiment, the Bremen DMM. When Tolman took over the command, Bremen DMM seethed and boiled like a sulphur lake. Racial disputes had created a schism between the native Bremen citizens and the recruits from other worlds. The day after she arrived, a riot occurred in a town near their base, killing three townspeople. Tolman immediately investigated, found that two of her mech warriors were to blame, and ordered them hanged. Slowly, her daily drills and manoeuvres began to turn the unit around. If any member of the unit screwed up, the entire regiment would receive punishment. Units that logged less than five hours of atmospheric drop instruction now dropped every weekend. Four months after she took command of the Bremen DMM, a strong Curita raiding party broke through the thin Davian perimeter defences, landed on the industrial world of New Iverson, and quickly overpowered the meagre garrison. As not a single house regiment was in position to challenge this, Tolman instantly went into action. Two weeks after the fall of New Iverson, her mechs dropped from a hastily requisitioned collection of military and merchant craft. The regiment fought brilliantly, routing the surprised Curitan defenders and liberating the planet with minimal losses. That victory united the squabbling battalions into a single force under a single charismatic commander. Though the men and women of Tolman's regiment love her dearly, many move on to house regiments. A Bremen lance leader could easily lead a company in any house unit, 
while company and battalion commanders are constantly leaving for high posts in the military. Tolman herself constantly turns down offers of promotion, remaining loyal to her regiment. The Clovis Draconis March Militia Commander Major General Clement VIII Planetary Mission, Planetary Defense Strength 92% listed Standard Fighter Rating Green Losses 15.42% Battle Force Value 493 Most of the Clovis DMM's mech warriors and techs come from Kentaris IV, the site of the worst massacre ever committed in the human sphere. During the First Succession War, Jinjiro Kirita ordered his troops to slaughter the citizens of Kentaris to avenge the death of his father on the planet. The planet has yet to recover from the loss of 90% of its population. The Clovis DMM ached for a battle with the Draconis Combine. The leaders on New Avalon, however, were terrified that the untried unit would be destroyed. Until the Geltor emergency, the regiment participated only in a single field raid on Felonin III. New Avalon chose that barren, godforsaken world because Takashi Kirita had erected a 100 meter tall monument to Jinjiro on a prominent mountaintop. For three days, the Clovis DMM launched attack after attack against the Kirita mechs holding the mountain passes. The Draconis Combine leaders were convinced that Davian knew about the secret aerospace fighter factory built into the mountain range. However, the Clovis DMM just sought a more personal revenge. When they did finally break through the defences, the Davian mech warriors rushed up the mountain toward the statue, ignoring the Curitan attempts to evacuate the factory grounds. When the Davian regiment got around to overturning the factory, dropships had already lifted off with most of the usable equipment. The statue was sent in pieces back to Kentares, Jinjiro's desecrated head now resting in Marta Square amid the rusting, decayed shells of the old capital buildings. The Robinson Draconis March Militia Commander, District Commander Andrew Cunningham Primary Mission, Quick Response Strength, 93% listed Standard Fighting Rating Green Losses, 10% Battle Force Value, 507 points No one, especially the Regimental Commander Andrew Cunningham, thought that the Robinson DMM was fit to fight a prolonged battle. The unit didn't even qualify as a regiment. Acting more as a way station, it consisted of pieces of companies or battalions awaiting transportation or new orders. At the outbreak of the Curitan invasion of Galtor, the Robinson DMM consisted of a company of mech warriors waiting for mechs to be delivered, a company of battle-hardened mech warriors from the Certus Fusiliers teaching the latest electronic countermeasures, a company of mech warriors so green that they look like onions, white heads and long green bodies, survivors of mid-air collisions that killed a dozen techs and mech warriors, and a light fire company without any ammunition, electronic sensing devices, or actuators for the legs. None of these units had ever met one another, much less fought together, until they were billeted in the same jump ship. Faced with such a diverse collection of machines and bodies, it's understandable that Commander Cunningham took so long to strike against Curita. Although the Robinson DMM didn't train together, it fought well. The Certus Fusiliers in particular outpaced the rest of the regiment as it forced its way into New Derry during Phase 3 of the campaign. Interviewed afterward by a Federated Sun Newsweekly, the company commander, Yvonne Mika, stated that they just wanted to have it done with and go home. Eyewitnesses reported that Yvonne and her mech warriors continued to give classes on the correct ECM and AEP procedures while under fire from Curitan mechs. The 33rd Avalon Hussars Commander, Lieutenant General Wilson Mandela Primary Mission, Assault Strength, 125% listed Standard Fighting Rating, Veteran Losses, 84.354% Battle Force Value, 750 points Like all Avalon Hussar regiments, the 33rd Avalon Hussars were created to expand Lucian Davian's power over his nearby neighbours. For each star system that joined him, he created a military unit called the Hussars to garrison the planet. And by the time the Crucis Pact was signed in 2317, 26 Hussar regiments defended the inner star systems of the newly formed Federated Sons. By 2405, everyone called them the New Avalon Hussars, and finally, the Avalon Hussars. These regiments proved their worth during the Age of War that followed. The regiments fought all over the Federated Sun's sphere of influence. Every year, new Hussar regiments were added to the growing Federated Sun military strength, until there were 60 Avalon Hussar regiments. In 2431, the 33rd Avalon Hussars defended the planet Kentaris IV against a force from the Terran hegemony. The Terran units completely destroyed the Hussars, and it wouldn't be their last defeat. Many decades later, the Federated Sons gained battle mech technology. 
The joint commanders of the remaining Avalon Hussars, however, considered the battle mech to be too slow, heavy, and impractical. They refused to train with the new machines. As leaders of new Avalon created new regiments, they gradually withdrew funding to the Hussars. The military census then of 2700 revealed that only 15 regiments that stubbornly stuck to the name of Avalon Hussars remained. With the emergence of the Star League, these units were reduced to little more than planetary garrisons. The Hussars looked forward to the First Succession War. At last, they could prove their worth to the Federated Sons. Gaily, with flags flying, they marched off to war in a dozen worlds. It was a massacre. Kirita and Lao Battlemech shattered the Hussars' outdated tanks and hovercraft. And though the Hussars fought magnificently, their machines couldn't match the power of a battle mech. In six years, all 15 Hussar regiments were decimated. After the peace treaties of 2821, the Hussars were a collection of tech support troops, air units and other small scattered pieces. The survivors had no qualms about using battle mechs. They accepted the machines gratefully and from any source they could find. In 2828, just in time for the Second Succession War, the leaders of New Avalon christened the newly minted 33rd Avalon Hussars. The brightly painted mechs marched past the reviewing stand and directly onto ships headed for the Lao border. They dropped on Novaya Zemlya, a major industrial centre for the Capellan Confederation. Fighting in the ruins of the planet's capital, the Hussars met the Prefectorate Guard from the Capellan Hussars of House Lao. In two days of bloody fighting, the veteran Lao Guard crushed the 33rd Avalon Hussars, barely 10% of their mechs surviving. This time, propaganda saved them. Media consultants warned that announcing the destruction of the 33rd after all the coverage given to them would disastrously decrease morale in the Federation. The remnants of the 33rd were once again sewn into a viable regiment. Since then, the 33rd Hussars have teetered on the brink of annihilation twice. Each time, enough was salvaged to knit the unit back together. The press calls the 33rd the regiment that wouldn't die. Each mech warrior in the regiment hopes they're right. The 4th Crucis Lancers. Commander, Major General Charles Duncan. Primary mission, assault. Strength, 125% listed. Standard fighting rating, veteran. Losses, 11.953%. Battle force value of 785 points. Minoru Kirita once remarked, The Crucis Lancers are the finest marksmen in the galaxy. Fortunately, there aren't many of them. For most of their history, the Crucis Lancers have consisted of no more than three regiments. New Avalon designed all Crucis Lancer regiments as heavy assault forces, stuffed with mechs and crewed by some of the best mech warriors in the Federation. The 4th Crucis Lancers developed from members of a heavy mech regiment that refused to follow Alexander Kerensky into exile. For 50 years, New Avalon tried to bring the unit up to its designated strength. Every time it got one battalion outfitted, however, a crisis would force the Federation to send in the 4th with only half its mechs. Even so, the understrength regiment led five successful assaults against the Capellan Confederation. To counter a powerful Curita force on New Aberdeen, Davian assembled the 4th, 5th, and 7th Crucis Lancers into the most powerful Davian Brigade in history. After the brigade dropped onto the planet, however, Curita threw in more and more regiments, isolating the 4th with two regiments, and yard by yard, the Draconis Combine troops reduced the pocket, but they couldn't destroy the regiment. For three weeks, the 4th remained isolated with half of its available mechs verging on breakdown. When Davian reinforcements finally came, Less than half the original mechs were functioning. Hereditary appointments are a fact of life in many older regiments. When a mech warrior dies, all the relatives are polled to see who will occupy the mech's seat. The Crucis's long campaign on Aberdeen piled up claims and counterclaims to almost every piece of its equipment. Every day, the commanders of the Crucis Lancers Brigade found themselves embroiled in lawsuits over battle mechs and rights of repair and salvage. One family even sued the 4th Crucis Lancers commander for abandoning a useless Banshee battle mech. To settle such annoyances, the large 7th Crucis Lancer Brigade broke up, and the number of Crucis Lancer regiments grew to eight. The court spent a year sorting through the claims and counterclaims afterward, with each regiment being brought to full strength with new mechs and inexperienced mech warriors. Although now classified as just a medium regiment, the 4th still retains its powerful assault lance, artillery, and air squadron. The 12th Vegan Rangers Alpha Regiment. Commander, Margrave Sheridan Douglas. Primary mission assault. Strength 150% listed. Standard fighting rating, elite. 
Losses, 45.345%. Battle force value, 1,148 points. From Terra, the bright star Vega shines out like a beacon. In many ways, it was a beacon for explorers and colonists during the Exodus. Settlers flocked to Vega's two habitable planets, both blessed with warm climates and plentiful water. One of Vega's founding fathers was Loran, a ranger for the Synthetic Victories Corporation. In those ancient times, rangers patrolled the vast areas of empty space between planets of a single system. It was a job suited for people who didn't mind being alone for six months at a time. In his book, Eleven Against the Stars, Loran set down the principles by which he and his fellow ten rangers lived. A ranger, Loran wrote, needed to live simply and honestly, without delusions or manias. A ranger values loyalty, but never follows others blindly. He must serve people, not corporations, and above all, must remain free to follow his own destiny. Over 57 years later, a young boy growing up in the periphery read the book and vowed that he would be the 12th vegan ranger. That young man grew to be one of the greatest mercenary leaders of the successor states. His name was Lawrence Hellman Nelson, better known as the Duke of Verde. The Duke lived most of his life in exile, hiding from the man who had usurped his father's throne. Nelson spent the first succession war in the cockpit of his Wolverine battle mech. To hide his true identity, the young Duke called himself the 12th Vegan Ranger and used Ranger Loran's symbol, a V against a bright star. Many people took notice of this tall, lanky youngster with an intense gleam in his eye and incredible acrobatic skill. Although given dozens of offers to join the best mercenary units, Nelson had other plans. He knew he needed his own army to regain his lost throne. Nelson began to look for men who fit his notion of a good mech warrior. The rules he followed were very similar to the principles set out by late Ranger Loran. The young duke formed a lance, a small company, and then finally a battalion of mechs and vehicles. He chose only the best mech warriors he could find, and something in his manner made them work for him at half the usual rate. Perhaps it was his sense of mission, a luxury in the cutthroat world of the mercenary, that drew so many good men to it. Throughout the First Succession War, Nelson plotted and schemed his revenge. The man who killed his father was himself killed by his sister, the Contessa de Maveo. She took over the throne as regent for her brother's two young sons, and less than a year later, both were dead, and the consulari at the court were instructed to call the regent Queen Maveo. Verde desperately needed an army to defend against the hordes of Curitan raiders that constantly prowled their system. Therefore, when an intense mercenary captain presented himself at the court, Queen Maveo didn't turn him away. Aware of her situation, he offered to help. Although she offered him compensation way below standard, he accepted, to her great surprise and suspicion. And that is how the real Duke of Verde came to work for the family that murdered his father. Nelson did more than clear Curitan pirates from the trade routes. He revamped the militia forces there, he set up training camps and continued to recruit the best independent mech warriors in the Federated Sons. This activity made New Avalon sit up and take notice. After all, everyone had considered Verde a small backwater duchy of minor to middling importance, not a military powerhouse that it was quickly becoming. Queen Maveo never trusted the man with no real name. After two years, she pieced together enough of the truth to a terrifier. To rid herself of this pretender to the throne of Verde, she dispatched elements of her personal guard to challenge him in combat. One warm summer night in 2829, four mechs painted in curita markings floated down from a dropship around Nelson's simple wood frame house. With searing blazes of laser fire, the mechs ignited the house. Meanwhile, Nelson, alerted to the attack by friends within Queen Maveo's air force, had withdrawn with his mechs to a nearby water tower. When the flames were at their highest, Nelson's Wolverine leapt down onto one of the mechs, a Thunderbolt. The Thunderbolt's long-range missile rack exploded, blowing the cockpit apart. The three remaining mechs scattered and tried to surround the elusive Wolverine. Nelson, however, lured them through twisted ruins on the outskirts of the city. An assassin mech rushed around a corner only to be met with a fusillade of fire from Nelson's whirlwind autocannon. Setting up his autocannon as a remote, Nelson let loose two of his three remaining rounds, the other two mechs instantly turning to the noise. Creeping around the side of a smouldering sewing machine factory, 
Holding a red-hot beam from the factory, the Wolverine sprang up from behind and jammed the metal into the exhaust vents of the Hunchback's left rear torso heat sinks. The jagged metal lance piercing the lighter back armor and penetrating into the mech's ammunition bay, exploding 19 auto cannon rounds and throwing Nelson's Wolverine end over end into the ruins of the sewing machine factory. As the final mech, a Warhammer, closed in on the overheated and shut down Wolverine, a Locust mech from the 12 Vegan Rangers arrived and engaged the Warhammer. Although it was doomed, the Ranger did buy enough time for Nelson's mech to cool down. With a deafening roar, the Wolverine's jets ignited and shot him on a horizontal course straight at the Warhammer. Although he missed the mech's cockpit, he did manage to clip one of the particle cannon arms, swinging the heavy mech around and knocking it into an electrical power substation. There was a blinding flash of sparks, and then silence. Nelson saved the life of the Warhammer's mech warrior for evidence that Queen Mavea was behind the assassination attempt. Later, the mech warrior was hanged along with Queen Maveo and her entourage. Lawrence Hellman Nelson regains the Duchy of Verde. 200 years later, the 12 vegan rangers continued to grow and prosper. Throughout the Second and Third Succession Wars, the rangers completed a number of tasks for the Davian government, but they've resisted offers to join the regular military. Today, Sarah Nelson sits on the throne at Verde, with her most loyal subject, Margrave Sheridan Douglas. She's expanded the 12 Vegan Rangers into four regiments of independent troops who contract for the Federated Sons, Princes of the Periphery, and also for the Lyran Commonwealth. Currently, all four regiments are employed by the Federated Sons, who pay a premium for their continued loyalty. The 22nd Special Air Squadron, Commander Colonel Sirius Golan. Primary mission, Upper Atmosphere Defense. Strength, 120% listed. Standard fighting rating, Veteran. Losses, 37.12%. Battle force value, 213 points. The 22nd Special Air Squadron deserves special mention for the stalwart job they performed during their first mission, the Galtor Campaign. The backbone of the 22nd is the two elite and one veteran air lancers of STU-K5 Stuka heavy fighters. These powerful lancers tore up the 3rd Benjamin Regulars Regiment as it struggled in the minefield on Galtor 3. They then covered the retreat of the 33rd Avalon Hussars and later flew patrol over the real Star League storehouse. Outnumbered 4-1 to one by the Curitan fighter squadrons, the 22nd pilots would fly double and triple the number of recommended missions, resting only when their machines needed servicing. After three months of gruelling attrition, the men and women of the 22nd verged on exhaustion and mental collapse. Still, when the Curitans made their final push against the Star League storehouse, the 22nd kept the Curita fighters off the backs of the 12th Vegan Rangers. The 782nd Davian Guards Auxiliary Commander Colonel Blood and Guts Oliver Primary Mission Defense Perimeter Strength 200% listed Standard Fighting Rating Elite Losses 100% Battle Force Value 387 points A standard auxiliary company contains as many units as a battle mech battalion Instead of a lance, the basic unit of a Davian company is the platoon, each with 21 to 28 soldiers. A standard company will have two heavy platoons with extra firepower and electronic sensing devices, three platoons of troops riding lightly armoured wheeled transports, and one platoon of jump infantry. The rest of the troops anywhere from four to six platoons are regular infantry. Occasionally, a battery of three sniper artillery pieces with its attendant armoured scout cars are attached to the company. The Galtor Irregulars Commander, Committee of Four. Primary mission, Planetary Defense. No listing for strength. Standard fighting rating, green. Losses, 91.333%. Battle force value, 400 points. The Geltor Irregulars formed at Hansa Davian's request to sabotage the Curita base on the planet. Davian Johnny teams landed on the planet to shape the revolutionaries into an effective fighting force. As noted in the history chapter, the forces were successful against Curita's second and third line troops, but were no match for fully equipped field regiments. Although the seesaw battles tore up the Irregulars force, enough would survive to instill the Galtorians with the importance of a planetary unit. This conviction ran directly against the desires of New Avalon, which wanted all arms under the direct control of the Federated Sun's military. Because Hansa Davian couldn't refuse men and women who had sacrificed so much to become Davian citizens, he allowed four units to remain in skeleton form. Seizing the opportunity, the Galtor military leaders immediately began buying equipment and supplies on the black market. 
General Yao Xiang scored the greatest coup by buying ten battle mechs for a million bushels of corn. These mechs would join the two dozen Kurita mechs captured during the liberation. Other fighting vehicles were easier to obtain. Dozens of old Demolisher and Von Luckner tanks arrived at the spaceport in New Derry. Galleons, Swiftwind scout cars and military transport vehicles filled warehouses throughout the country. In 3024, the combined might of the Galtor Irregulars paraded down the main street of New Derry in a sparkling and splendid display of national pride and accomplishment. All units displayed the Galtor flag, a highly stylized shaft of golden wheat on a green field. Except for General Lau's medium battle max, which displayed the sword and son of the Federated Sons, the event was carried on every major video service in Davian space and beyond. By the end of the Galtor campaign, all these units were no more. Most of the Green Galtor units didn't perform well in battle. O'Neill's Legion lost most of its heavy armour in ten minutes of battle with General Yoriyoshi's mechs, the Galtor Flying Squadron lost its ground contingent soon after, and the six light fighters had uh, to use New Derry as a base. General Yao Xiang's brigade fought well in the confines of New Derry, although its artillery batteries surrendered to the 8th Galadon regulars after firing less than 30 rounds of ammunition. Individual units could fight extremely well if backed up by regulars. For instance, police and fire department units, supported by a few lone wolf mechs, defended their neighbourhoods with furious determination. The Lone Wolves Commander, The Committee Primary mission, none. Strength, no listing available. Standard fighting rating, veteran. Losses, 75%. Battle force value, 880 points. A wolf is a predatory animal found on Terra. The male of the species usually hunts high in the mountains and makes quite a lonely sight along a high ridge. Like his namesake, the Lone Wolf Mercenary Regiment is a predatory organisation, small in number, which hunts together or alone. However, the Lone Wolves do not inspire loneliness. They inspire fear. The Lone Wolf unit exists because justice among the mercenaries of the periphery is a rough affair. If a lance gets out of line, its members could find themselves stripped of mechs and money, and left to rot on some godforsaken planet. However, when a defending lance is too big or too dangerous to be thrown out, a prudent mercenary commander will request that the offenders join the Lone Wolves. Throughout the years, scores of lancers and companies have passed through the Wolves organization on their way to other employment. Some stay for a few years or a few months. The Wolves that stay the longest remain because no one else will have them and because it's too dangerous to be alone in the periphery even if one is strapped into a 50-ton war machine. Many desperate men have joined the wolves to escape or hide, and many more are buried without a name or a regret. Although the unit changes every year, the essential character of the wolves remain. The wolves live by a creed unlike any other mercenary unit in the successor states. Each company, each lance, and in some cases each battle neck is considered a separate entity that owes no allegiance to the separate units. A mech warrior must pay a fee to use the wolves' repair room supply facility. Disposable items are extra. Each meal pack, each litre of fuel, each bullet, shell or missile is paid for up front and in hard currency. The lead company in the wolves, the committee, negotiates all mercenary fees. At the beginning of each day, all mercenaries are paid in full. Even in the midst of the siege of New Derry, the committee demanded daily payment for all active mechs. Individual units within the walls can choose to fight or flee as they see fit. In addition, if they don't like the odds or the deal, they can leave. Once a unit accepts money to fight, however, it's expected to be ready for battle. The 17th Benjamin Regulars Commander, General Siovo Yoriyoshi Primary Mission Heavy Assault Strength, 175% listed Standard Fighting Rating Veteran Losses, 63.798% Battle Force, value 1,219 points. If General Yoriyoshi loved anything, he loved his 17th Benjamin Regiment. Every year he would visit the planets within his district and pass out scholarships to the Sunjiang Academy. Those who accepted the scholarships had to spend three years in the 17th Benjamin Regulars. Wisely, Yoriyoshi picked many students with wealthy families who then contributed large amounts of money to the regimental coffer. Consequently, the 17th grew fat with money and equipment. The district commander gave his regiment first pick of new mechs or technology that came from the government. What Luthien couldn't provide, Yoriyoshi bought on the black market. This abundance of material attracted many good officers and mech warriors. 
Menachem Gonan, the 17th's best battalion commander, turned down command of a regiment in the Pest Regulus because he would take a substantial cut in pay and command fewer heavy and assault mechs. Though the warlord acquired mechs like toy soldiers, he never hesitated about sending his shiny war machines into battle. The 17th fought a dozen engagements with Davian and Steiner raiding parties between 3020 and 3025. Yoriyoshi would lead his men into battle just to test the latest technological advance. While the mech warriors deployed on the field, scientists and technicians crammed into the mobile HQ at the regimental battle group would observe some variant of a medium laser or new type of armour. The 17th is currently stationed on the planet Benjamin. Its new commander is General Hiroshi Shotogama, who is also the new warlord of the Benjamin Military District. The Third Benjamin Regulus Commander, Brigadier General Giacodo Nagochido Primary Mission Heavy Assault Strength 99% listed, standard fighting rating regular. Losses 32.767%. Battle force value 662 points. Nagochidu has none of his former warlord's determination and fierce dedication. A soft, rather large fellow, he often drinks too much at parties and is thoroughly unprofessional in dress and demeanour. Although packed with heavy and assault mechs, his regiment rates are only a regular fighting status. In fact, the 3rd Benjamin Regulus is one of the few Kurita regiments that allow green mech warriors to pilot heavy mechs. The 3rd's performance during the Galtor campaign revealed signs of neglect and a lack of discipline. The drop onto the planet was botched because staffers set their primary objective to be a swamp miles away from the planned site. Nagachido himself dropped badly and spent hours trapped and isolated in his overheated mech. The mechs that did assault the fake Star League be uh, depot bunched up while clearing the 12 bands of minefields, thus offering superb targets for Davian Air Forces. Supply officers forgot to bring the advanced electronic devices for clearing the minefields as well. After the first two days of fighting, the third listed 27 mechs destroyed beyond repair, 10 damaged and 3 missing. Two Slayer medium fighters were also destroyed. The regiment didn't kill a single Davian mech and barely scratched the Davian air cover. Disgusted with his general's performance, Yoriyoshi immediately transferred the 3rd Benjamin Regulus out of the campaign and to the planet Irizun. The 11th Benjamin Regulus Commander General Innocent IV Primary mission is sector defence. Strength 100% listed. Standard fighting rating regular. Losses 15.2%. Battle force value 413 points. The 11th Benjamin Regulus was formed in 2781 as a light mixed regiment with a single battalion of mechs and two of armour. For 200 years it fought various battles, including the vicious repression of a mutiny on Junction. In 3001, poor management coupled with neglect brought the regiment to its weakest point. That year, with less than 28 light and medium mechs at its disposal, General Maratan met a Steiner mech regiment on Severin. In less than an hour, the 11th was ground up and spit out. The skeleton regiment lay moribund for 22 years until warlord Yoriyoshi convinced the coordinator to rebuild the unit. In late 3023, Yoriyoshi wooed Brigadier General Civil with a promotion to General and Command of the Reformed Regiment, now with a complete complement of light and medium mechs. Civil changed his name to Innocent IV, married Yoriyoshi's former mistress and joined his new HQ on New Year's Day, 3024. General Innocent IV was the perfect man to lead a light regiment. He personally shunned the heavy mechs popular with combine commanders and demanded that his men master essential light regiment techniques like long-range reconnaissance, skirmishing, hit-and-run drops, ambushes, screening larger forces, and end-run maneuvers. He moved the 11th's main base on Tripoli to the middle of the planet's petrified desert because it was too close to the halls of the city, and for months at a time the regiment underwent extensive training. By 3025, the regiment was at its peak and ready for any mission. Galtor III gave them their first taste of combat. The 6th Benjamin Regulars Commander Brigadier General Sa'ad Shazli Primary mission sector defence, strength 93% listed, standard fighting rating green, losses 10%, battle force value 430 points. The 6th Benjamin Regulars played a minor role in the Galtor campaign. Its commander, Brigadier General Sa'ad Shazli, suffered an ulcer attack the night before any battle, therefore he rarely attacked. The Sikh gained valuable experience about dropping, supply and communications during the Galtor campaign, but little about any actual fighting. This regiment lost more men and machines due to accident than actual damage. 
The regiment's only battle would occur with a patrol on the, of the 12th Vegan Rangers. The Rangers surprised the Light Company from Sultan uh, Jalahadeen's battalion and chased it back to the 6th main camp. There, the Rangers suddenly encountered three lances of heavy mechs, fully armed and ready. The pursuit instantly changed into a rout as the Rangers retreated before the vastly superior machines. The Curita news agency used this small incident for propaganda, describing a furious Davian attack against an outnumbered regiment of brave Curita lads. The brave Combine soldiers stood their ground and sent the Davians fleeing with their tails tucked between their legs. Within three weeks, the story was expanded into a book and then into a video special. By the time the Sixth had rotated out of the campaign, it was heralded as the saviour of the Draconis Combine. The 21st Galadon Regulars Commander Brigadier General Javek Dolmese, Earl of Marlow. Primary mission, sector defence. Strength, 98% listed. Standard fighting rating of regular. Losses, 37.3%. Battle force value, 547 points. The 21st Galadon Regulars served very little time on Galtor III. The regimental commander thought the whole adventure a foolish waste of men and machines. And after the campaign, Dolmassi and his men were given a hero's welcome back home on Marlow's Rift. When asked to comment on his reported heroism, he responded, It was involuntary. They had to push me out of the dropship. Throughout the era of the Star League, Marlow's Rift stood with the Federated Sons, its young men serving in Davian regiments, Star League units, and of course in the Marlow's Rift militia, which remained independent. Draconis Combine sympathisers gained high posts within the militia and at the start of the First Succession War, it revolted and took over the government. Davian military units promptly landed and liberated the capital, but the Draconis Combine responded by sending a three-regiment brigade that crushed the Davian presence. Since then, the planets remained a member of the Combine. The Marlow's Rift militia evolved into the 21st Galadon Regulars, which continues to recruit heavily from the planet. The 5th Galadon Regulars Commander General Grieg Samsonov, primary mission assault, strength 100% listed, standard fighting rating veteran, losses of 61.953%, battle force value 570 points. General Samsonov is determined to make the 5th Galadon Regiment the flagship of the Galadon Regulars. For the last 100 years, the 5th was stationed along the periphery, campaigning against pirates and bandit kings. In fact, it was General Samsonov's brilliant campaign against the Belt Pirates that earned him command of the Galadon district in 3019. Of course, the 5th went with him. Since then, the unit has struggled to adapt itself to fighting a different type of warfare. During their first mission against the Federated Sons in 3019, two regiments of the 7th Crucis Lancers Brigade struck the regiment, which disintegrated in panic. Many of the 5th's mech warriors had never seen so many mechs in one place at one time. Only the timely intervention of the 8th Galadon regulars would save the 5th from complete destruction. It is rumoured that Subhash Indrahar, director of the ISF, put General Samsonov in his pocket after that defeat, compromising the general's reputation. Supposedly, Indrahar allows the general great freedom but reviews all military appointments. It's certain that Takashi Kurita doesn't trust Samsonov. He once ordered the entire palace swept for electronic bugs after Samsonov made just a brief visit. The 8th Galadon Regulars Commander Brigadier General Victor Nicholas Primary Mission Quick Response Strength 112% listed Standard Fighting Rating Veteran Losses 25% Battle Force Value 706 points In 3011 the Galadon Regulars suffered a series of humiliating defeats mostly because Davian forces always reinforced its garrisons faster than Galadon attackers could exploit weaknesses For every battalion the Galadons threw into the fray Davian instantly found a battalion to counterattack the secret of Davian's mobility was its quick response forces, always kept ready to reinforce beleaguered units. Takashi Kurita demanded that the DCMS match these forces, and in response, General Samsonov created the 8th Galadon Regulars, a strange collection of individual units from three different services. Commanded by Brigadier General Victor Nicholas, the regiment consisted of a veteran independent assault battalion led by the arrogant Sir Henry Gates, an assault battalion from the Proserpina Hussars, and a third battalion of green mech warriors with no experience between them. A Star Lord jump ship was assigned to the unit, as were three Union and two Leopard class dropships. Nicholas threw himself into the task of uniting these separate elements into a hard hitting force. A year later, he got his chance to test his methods. On the planet Macomb, the 12th Galadon Regulars Regiment was facing certain destruction by a powerful Davian force. Nicholas personally made the hyperspace calculations to bring the jump ship dangerously close to the magnetic field of the planet, much closer than any responsible jump ship captain would allow. 
It then came out of hyperspace safely, though shaking like a leaf in a hurricane, and the 8th dropped barely in time to save the 12th. Takashi Kurita's quick response force was a smashing success. The second Galadon regulars. Commander General Lavrenti Kornilov. Primary mission sector defense. Strength 95%. Standard fighting rating green. Losses 75.3%. Battle force value 441 points. In 3014, General Fastius Semronovic, commander of the second Galadon regulars, received a summons to appear before the assembly of the Grand Inquisitor, the Combine's military court. Those called before the court are usually never seen again. Semronovic, however, had done nothing wrong, and he called for his aide, Brigadier General Lavrenti Kornilov, for advice. Although agreeing that the general was innocent of any wrongdoing, Kornilov convinced him to commit seppuku, or ritual suicide, to leave his honour intact. Upon the general suicide, Kornilov informed the DCMS High Command that Semronovich had killed himself because he'd been unfaithful to his wife. Subsequently, Kornilov assumed command of the 2nd Galadon regulars. The Galadon Tech Defense League. Commander, non. Primary mission, dropship defense. Strength, no listing available. Standard fighting rating, green. Losses, 91.333%. Battle force value, 196 points. During protracted struggles, regiments often pool their technicians and administrative troops into a single main base, a kind of super-regimental administrative group. If threatened by ground forces, the group can simply board the nearby dropships and lift off the planet. These highly trained men and women possess so much training and knowledge that they're almost never risked in combat. Nevertheless, all technicians and admin personnel undergo rigorous hand-weapon training just in case they're forced to defend a base. Commonly, support troops learn to crew tanks, hovercraft, and light artillery. The Galadon Tech Defense League fought well on Galtor III. General Samsonov formed the group to cover the retreat of the 8th Galadon regulars and the 2nd Amphigean group. One reason they performed so well was that Davian forces tried to capture the techs in order to persuade them to switch sides. The Amphigean Light Assault Group 1st Amphigean Light Assault Group Commander General Olivet Safathwaite Primary mission assault, strength 100% listed, standard fighting rating veteran, losses 31.31%, battle force value 943 points. Second Amphigean Light Assault Group, Commander Brigadier General Karl Gramanov, mission assault, strength 100% listed and standard fighting rating medium, losses 46.333%, battle force value of 615 points. Back in the dim Star League past, Amphigean Agriculture Incorporated was a leading agricultural company, with offices all over the Inner Sphere. Amphigean Agriculture worked on solutions to worldwide famines, crippling crop diseases, cultural and religious differences, and hundreds of other problems. The Succession Wars placed an incredible strain on this network. To defend their holdings, the Amphigean Agriculture began employing mercenary units to protect their property and employees. And by 2811, the cost of such protection had skyrocketed, and the board of directors decided it was cheaper to maintain a private army than to pay mercenaries exorbitant fees. Thus was the first Amphigean security group created. During the next 100 years, these security forces protected many of the company's factories, storehouses, and installations from the rapacious desires of the successor states. Many corporations gathered around the Amphigean's defences like peasants around the skirts of a castle. The board of directors began charging these businesses a protection fee and, soon after, rented out the first Amphigean security group to Ceres Metals for a punitive action against the debtor. By 2952, Amphigean Agriculture received 21% of its revenue from renting out its six security battalions. The next year, the Draconis Combine approached the company with a proposal to create two regiments of mercenaries under long-term contract to House Curita. The program was so successful that Lord Curita ordered a third regiment formed in 2976. All Amphigean regiments are run like corporations. Commanders are responsible for turning a profit, and they get bonuses if they exceed the quota. Amphigean agriculture owns all machines and treats its mech warriors like hired hands, not noble warriors of a heroic age. Nevertheless, Amphigean pays high wages to its mercenaries and gives them the organisation and security of a government without annoying oaths of loyalty or class distinction. In fact, Amphigean regiments are some of the few that make it a policy to promote from within. Any man or woman who can both lead mech warriors into battle and balance an account book can go far in the Amphigean Light Assault Group. During the Galtor campaign, the Light Assault Groups operated at a dead loss. By contractual agreement, the Amphigeans would have received a twelfth of any Star League cash. That loss, coupled with the heavy combat losses, 
dropped amphigian stock prices in the Draconis Combine. The last group here all just dumped together because three of them don't even have write-ups, they just have some stats. But the 82nd Galadon Artillery, commanded by General John Henry Westman, primary mission assault, strength 135%, listed with standard fighting rating of veteran, losses 0%, uh, the 82nd Galadon Artillery has the unique distinction of being the only unit involved in the Galtor campaign that didn't lose a single man or machine. Under the direct control of General Samanov, the unit participated in many operations during the campaign, always acquitting itself admirably. Three days before the Benjamin regulars withdrew, the artillery transferred out of the campaign. Then there's the Kismet Battalion of the Seventh Sword of Light, Commander was Colonel Tiresias Blood and Guts Oliver, primary mission assault, strength 125% listed, standard fighting rating elite, uh, losses 125%. So basically they were completely wiped out, but there's no write-up for them for some reason. Then there's Marushi's Independent Assault Battalion, commanded by Colonel Hector Marushi. Primary mission was assault, no listed strength, but they lost 89% of their forces. And finally there was the 512th Imperial Artillery Battalion, commanded by uh, Colonel Chuang Kao. Primary mission was fire support, 112% strength listed, standard fighting rating of veteran, and lost about 25% of their troops. And overall, that's the entire listing of every single unit that fought in the battle in some form or another. Uh, it's a bit of a long one, I'm not going to lie, and there's only music for one bit with the Lone Wolves. Um, just because that piece of music, I think, feel just fit them quite well. I won't go over the actual battles themselves, as I feel the scenarios are, well, very small amount of write-up, and to be honest, uh, I'm kind of at this point wondering if I'm going to get a cease and desist from uh, from Catalyst if I read out the entire book. Um, hopefully not, but either way, uh, it's been a hell of a lot of fun doing this. I love some of the little notes about the units here. It was great to give them some more character and flair. You learned a little bit more about them before, during, or after the Galtor campaign, and it's really interesting stuff, it's really well put together, and I think this part probably equals out the longest part of the entire book. Uh, but as I said, I've listed all of the um, images there, so you can see all the, the unit logos, and accompanied with the battle force values for anyone who's mildly interested in seeing just how big some of these forces would get if you were to sort of total them all up as minis on the battlefield. Some of them would be quite large, some of them would be quite small, uh, but again, it's an interesting uh, little note to have, being able to see exactly what all these units had equipped uh, at the time of the, the campaign. Good oh God, my throat is giving me a, giving me hell at the moment. Um, so I'll uh, I'll wrap it up there. Thanks everybody. I uh, really enjoyed doing the Galtor campaign. It's one of the ones I wanted to do for a very very long time, and I'm glad that I've finally been able to get around to do it. And I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, uh, next campaign one, I'll probably get round to. I'll try and see if I can find something that will work as just another Innisphere v Innisphere, but if I can't, it'll be one of the classic Clan v Innisphere books. But uh, until then, have a good one, everybody. Thanks for listening. And I uh, hope you all have a good week or weekend, depending on when you listen to this, and I'll uh, catch you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>